Um, so the thing that the Lord showed me to do today is a little different for me, but I'm going to do it because I really feel like I heard his voice. You know, the day is uh, December 22nd, and uh, December 22nd of 1980 was a milestone day for me for a bad reason. Uh, it was the day that a family member of mine was murdered in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and uh, it was my father's brother. And we had a big, we still do, my family has a big business, a trucking business, and he was murdered outside of our office. And my father uh, walked out when he heard the shots. They were in the same office. It was about 5 o'clock at, uh, at night at the end of the day. And he saw the person who did it get in a car and pull away. But here it is 39 years later to the day, and no one has ever gone to trial for it. There's never been any conviction about it. So it was just an unsolved uh, problem. Now, you know, I'm not saying that everybody involved in our side of the story was innocent. Um, there were things that were happening that I didn't know about because I was 23 years old at the time. But I do know what happened to me was that I went on a really big crash. It got real dark for me emotionally. And, you know, when you're in a big family and, and there's a big family business, it's just things assumed that if you keep your act together and you, do, and you work hard and you do what we ask you to do, you're going to work here too. And this business might be yours someday too if, if you pass those tests. So they're not just going to hand it to you because uh, your name is Roselli. So uh, up to that point, you know, I was doing well there. I had a college degree, and I was dating somebody. I wasn't a Christian. My mom had gotten saved in uh, 1978, so this was 1980, so she had been Jesus freaking me, I called it. <laughs> I said, what happened to you? You're a good Catholic. You, now all you talk about is Jesus. What happened to all these other saints, Mary, St. Christopher, St. Anthony? Like, you used to tell me if I lost my keys, pray to that guy or pray to that guy. And now you're only talking about Jesus. What's, you're a Jesus freak. Stop. <laughs> and she would just leave tracks in the bathroom like she had a total strategy that everywhere I looked there was something with Jesus on it everywhere and she put a, a New Testament next to my bed it had an orange cover I, I, I'll never forget it and she said just read a chapter before you go to sleep at night you know she was relentless I had a friend that called her a bulldog because once she locked on you could not get her to let go <laughs> She witnessed to my father for 25 years, and he had a really bad temper, and he used to lose his temper really bad, and she would just back off for a little while. A lot of you knew my mother, so you know, like, if she locks on to something, you're not getting out of that thing. She's not letting go, and she wouldn't let go. It took 25 years, and in the car, riding down to the shore one day, he accepted the Lord before he died. So it's never too late. It's amazing, right? And, you know, it's not just a trucking company. It's a garbage trucking company, right? So, so many people, the Sopranos, there's just so many assumptions when, when people hear you're in the garbage trucking business and your uncle was murdered in front of the office and it looked like a hit from the mob. That's on the front page of the paper the next day, right? Now, you might think I knew what was going on. I really didn't. I just knew when I got up at 4.30 and I had to be to the office by 5, my uncles, who were the owners of the business, were already on the radio, they were already barking orders. So these guys were working from morning, 5 o'clock at night when I was given, coming in the office to say, okay, I'm going to head out. Now they're like, where are you going? If anybody's leaving early, it's us, not you. We've been doing this before you were born. Our whole lives lived through the Depression, built this big business. They were experts at what they did. So it was just always a given that that's what you were going to do for a living. If you were one of the sons, you were going to you know, help to, to run the business and take it over. But that one day changed everything. And this picture, if you could put that first slide up, it says in Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. How many fill that fill that description, that you were walking in darkness and you saw the great light of Jesus, right? And I don't mean to say anything bad about any other churches, but uh, it wasn't about religion. That's not what changed me and got me to see the light. It was understanding that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, and that didn't just automatically happen if you go inside a church, that you have to confess with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and turn away from that old sinful style. But the whole world was putting everything, emphasis was on sin. In, in my world of growing up, I was a football player. I was playing music in a rock band. And, you know, every party, you got invited to all the parties. It was all just decadence and sin. And the words of the songs just were blatant about it, right? Like nobody was even trying to hide the fact that we were involved in sin. And yet, I didn't have any counterbalancing 
worldview, we would say now. You mean there's another way to live? Like, isn't this what everybody wants to do? Like, I used to get up and play in the bar, and all of a sudden, when I come off from performing on, on a stage, not an altar, it was a stage, all of a sudden, you're Joe Popular now because you sing and you play the guitar. Just watch the old Beatles clips, and the girls are acting goofy, screaming their heads off. They didn't quite do that with me, but it was better than being just Joe from Idaho at the bar, when, when they knew you were in the band, something changed. It's the devil. It's a trap. So you're traveling on this path that you think you're going to go on, and in one minute, in one day, everything changes. And it gets real dark, and that's where I was. I, it was just really dark. The person that I was dating that I thought I might marry basically didn't want anything to do with me because when she saw my uncle you know, on, on the front page of the paper, you know, even her friends are saying, you don't know what you're getting involved in here. You don't want to do that, right? So can you blame her? Not, not really, because I didn't even know the full extent of what was going on. And she would be thinking, well, why wouldn't you know the full extent of what's going on? Uh, so that's, that's a different day's topic. The problem for me was, what do I do to get out of this hole? And the normal instincts for an unsafe person is you are going to get back at the person who did this to you. You're going to take vengeance because... That's what somebody who's loyal and noble would do. Except that's the exact path the devil wanted me to go on, right? Because I really didn't know what was going on. I didn't have any clues as to who did it or why they did it or anything. So you're living your life in a vacuum, and it feels like a dark hole. And without going through all the details, my mother had already become a Christian and had already been witnessing to me, and I didn't want anything to do with it. I was mocking her about it until now I was in a crisis, and I didn't know how to handle that crisis and I fought her and she would be you know putting this now when she was putting the Bible in front of me I knew I had more of a reason to want to try to get healed inside but I didn't think that was the answer so at the time I was at Seton Hall and uh, as God would have it one of my assignments was reading Dante's Inferno how's that for timing right like and I'm thinking man if this is true my uncle is there right now, and I'm going there. You know, I'm heading there. And it just all started, all these little things started to click because I saw how she was handling things. And I didn't want to admit that it looked like she had something that I didn't have. So I said, all right, you know, I'll read that stupid Bible you put next to my bed because I want to prove to you that it's a bunch of fairy tales and, and you have no idea what you're talking about and how many know God was going, yes, <laughs> right, yes. And I have an uncle, some of you know him, Sam Gerisi from uh, the mission down in Newark. And he would tell my mother, when you pray for him, picture him in church with his arms lifted up and him worshiping God. And she's like, man, that's going to be a stretch. But if you say so, okay. Because now he's going out in bars and playing secular music. You think he's going to be in church? And he said, well, look, you got you to gotta ask for it first. And then she would come up to me later, a lot of you know this. She says, not only do you have your hands lifted up, you're leading worship. Wow, it's even better than what I thought. Yeah, she was a very loyal fan, like president of the fan club. Because she spent 20 years praying for me, you know, before she even became born again. She was praying for me as a Catholic, too, right? And she was the one, she was like the referee in the family. If anybody had a question, they called Mary. <laughs> Which one, which saint is it that we pray to if you lose your keys versus when you're going on traveling and all this stuff? She knew all the rules because she had wanted to be a nun at one time. So I start reading the Bible. And uh, I knew I, you know, if you raise a Catholic church, you hear it in short bursts from the pulpit, but I wasn't getting any, any application. And they not only didn't encourage us to read the Bible at the time. They were telling us not to read the Bible at the time. And, and that's a shame, and I hope that's changed. I've heard it has changed in some places, but I didn't have any tools. I didn't know what I was even fighting against. I didn't even understand spiritual warfare at the time. I knew physical, you know, guys would get in fights all the time over girls, or, you know, I would walk in as a football player and some guy, you know, Napoleon complex kind of guy, you know what I mean by that? They have to prove that they're tough and they're going to take a swing at you because you're the big football guy. And if they get a lucky shot and knock you out, now they're like, oh, look, I knocked out the football player. And I'm like, come on, man. Peace, brother. Wait, Take it somewhere else. I don't want to fight. Here to have fun. I'm Italian. We're lovers. <laughs> it's just this whole 
stupid model that they put for you. But I started reading the Bible, and it was the New Testament, and I was in Galatians, and it said, you know, your spirit and your flesh are at war with each other. I'm kind of summarizing it now. And, and you can't do what your flesh wants you to do. And I'm like, that's been the problem. Oh, I have a spirit that wants to serve God, but my flesh wants to do this. And now all of a sudden, a light goes on. And now I start reading it through a different lens. And I'm also watching how she's handling the crisis that we're going through as a family. And there was something inside her that I didn't have. She had a piece about it. Even though she was grieving, she wasn't as off the rails as I was about it. Because I was depressed. You know, that's what happens. You, I thought my future was going to be in the business. Now I'm, I'm realizing I don't think I want to do this. I, if I don't know what's going on, how do I want to invest my life in this? But all up to that point, that was the plan. So you think I was trying to get A's in school? No, I was just trying to get through school because I knew I already had a job when I get out. Now, that was a bad idea, but that was the deck I was dealt. The devil is a liar, and he's, and he's just going to string you along like good liars do. So now, all of a sudden, I've got to start over. I've got, I'm not going to work for the family, but so what am I going to do? I hadn't even ever looked at any other careers, right? So that's a little depressing. And then the girl that you thought you were going to marry doesn't even want to talk to you anymore for nothing you did. So strike two. And now she's telling me, my mother, that I'm going to have to start living by these rules, which means I won't even have any friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get saved, and I went and saw my friends, and they thought I was what they call a narc. Anybody know what a narc is? Somebody that gets arrested and turns state's evidence and then goes undercover back in with the friends and doesn't tell them they got arrested. And they're like, there's no way he's straight. So he must have got busted and just not told us. And now he wants to get evidence on us. So they wouldn't even want to talk to me. <laughs> it's really quite a trap the devil set, isn't it? And the main thing that got me was her peace. That, like, through the process, there was a supernatural peace on her that I wanted so bad that I couldn't describe to you with language, but I could identify it when I saw it. Because I knew she was grieving, but yet I knew there was another tool in her toolbox that I didn't have. And I was getting in fights. I mean, really, that was not my personality, not my temperament. Some guy pulled a knife on me in a bar because I beat up his friend, and he was going to... And it's just going in the total wrong direction. You're doing more drugs now to medicate your pain because you don't know what to do, which makes you do dumber things than you were even doing before. And, you know, the police don't care. If you do something dumb, you get arrested for that. Thankfully, I didn't, but, man, I can't say I should not have gotten arrested for the dumb things I was doing, but it was the grace of God. That's what he does. So even if you're in darkness, you can look out that tunnel. I don't know if you could see her. She's down in the right little corner there, that little black head, and that's how I felt. Like, when, when I saw that there might be an answer, it felt like I was in a dark hole, and all of a sudden, the light started to shine. And I, and I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, are you willing to walk away from the lifestyle that you've been living for all these years? And you look at yourself back from the mirror and go, well, how's it been going for you so far? And the answer was bankrupt, terrible. People wanting to kill me for beating up their friend. I was never somebody who fought before, but part of that depression and swirling down was that you don't know what to do, so violence is one of the options to take out that pain that you're feeling on the inside. So it was um, New Year's Eve, actually, in 1982. The last day of, of New Year's Eve, I was out with my friends and, and partying, which is what people do on New Year's Eve, as you know. And uh, I wasn't really enjoying it. Like, the Lord had been on my trail to try to, you know, get me to change. And all of a sudden, the things that I was liking, I, I wasn't liking anymore. And um, my mother came in my bedroom because I was sleeping late because I had a hangover from New Year's Eve. And uh, she comes in with the vacuum. I'm sleeping in bed. She opens up the curtains. Bright, sunny day outside. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. She comes in with the vacuum. Like, oh, I got the headache from drinking. And uh, she's like, get up. Get out of bed. What are you? You're a bomb. Get, come on, get up. She wasn't normally like that either. You can't sleep all day. And uh, I go in the kitchen, and there's a guy named David Toma, who was a preacher on, on the 
just conveniently turned to that station when I walked in, and he's looking into the camera, and he's saying, go ahead, smoke another joint. <laughs> that joint you smoked last night was like a nail in your coffin. And, 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 the, and the drinks and the drug use, you're slowly killing yourself. And I'm in the, I'm in the kitchen like, oh, man. Like, I'm busted. He's talking to me. He had been a police officer, too. The show Beretta, actually, was after this guy in real life. He was that guy. And he became a fired-up evangelist preacher. And, and just right there at the kitchen table with the toast and the eggs and everything, you know, I'm like, I surrender, God. I can't do this anymore. And I, I was willing to walk away from that mess. 